Let me read to you a passage from the fifth chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, verses 43 to 48. It's the Gospel for Tuesday of the eleventh week in ordinary time. St. Matthew writes, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's from Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. It speaks of love. What do I mean? Well, the most important aspect of the mission of the church, meaning the mission of each and every member of the church, is the evangelization not just of every individual in the world, nor just the evangelization of every society and people, but the evangelization of culture. Every culture has its prevailing ethos, its unspoken assumptions, its distinctive aspirations, its special way of doing things, its preferences. These are what constitute the founts of culture. And the modern secular view has regarded religion as a fruit of culture, and a poor, even somewhat rotten, fruit of that. Christopher Dawson, who lived from 1889 to 1970, was perhaps the greatest English-speaking Catholic historian of the 20th century. He never ceased to affirm the fundamental importance of religion to civilization. As he wrote in 1925, and I quote, the great civilizations of the world do not produce the great religions as a kind of cultural byproduct. In a very real sense, the great religions are the foundations on which great civilizations rest. From his historical work, he drew the lesson that religious faith is the spark of culture, and external material success will not survive its being extinguished. Just before he ascended into heaven, Christ charged the eleven to make disciples of all the nations. Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 nations are to become disciples of Christ, not just individuals. It implies that the cultures of nations are to be evangelized. This means bringing the person and teaching of Jesus Christ to the foundations of national and social thought. The person and revelation of Christ is to be the basis of cultural thought, and the Church has been successful in this mission in the past. It was well on the way to evangelizing Roman civilization when the Roman world fell to the barbarians in the 5th and 6th centuries. Then the evangelization of the barbarian conquerors began, and this culminated in the emergence of Christian Europe. The Church has called on her members to begin a new evangelization of culture and civilization comparable to that which was achieved in previous ages. Nations with their cultures can be evangelized, with the aid of the all-powerful Spirit of God working through Christ's disciples. However, there is a danger that culture, once evangelized in a general sense, can be thought to do its work almost automatically. It can be assumed that people will be carried along by a Christian culture to follow Christ and His Church authentically. Now there is no doubt that a Christian culture is an immense help to the Christian life of a nation's members, just as there is no doubt that an anti-Christian culture or a religiously indifferent and secular culture can be a great obstacle 
to the flourishing of the Christian life of a society's members. We are supported or undermined, as the case may be, by the thought of others. Nevertheless, culture alone will not bring personal holiness. Apart from the grace of God, there must be ignited in each individual the resolve, the personal resolve, to seek holiness of life in Christ and according to his teaching. A culture may, through the persevering efforts of the church's members, become Christian and Catholic, but each individual must also be evangelized, formed and set on the path of holiness. The Christian life is not just a social and national matter, though in the modern secular world the very idea of a Christian culture and society is largely rejected. What is fundamental is that each individual know and love Jesus Christ in his own mind and heart as a matter of personal choice. Culture may support this, it may ignore it, or it may be hostile to it. Whatever be the case, the personal choice for Christ and love for him must not depend on culture, which is to say, on the society within which one is living. It is a very personal choice and it involves a radical decision to go the whole way with Jesus Christ. Love is above all a decision, and the decision is to take up one's cross every day and follow in the footsteps of the Master along the path of perfection. The great deficiency within Christ's faithful is always the failure to hear and take up this call to personal perfection. It is a moral and spiritual perfection, the perfection of love for Jesus. There are many temptations enticing Christ's disciples away from such a path, all summarized in the threefold caption, the world, the flesh and the devil. Those who take up the call can still fall away from it through succumbing to bad example, to spiritual sloth, to gratification, whatever. In our Gospel today that I read earlier, our Lord sets up a very high standard. We are not just to put up with our enemies, nor even just to forgive them, but we are to love them. Love your enemies. Our standard ought be the love that fills the heart of God our Heavenly Father. We are to seek the perfection of love, love model after that of God, and sharing in it by His gift of grace. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Our efforts to attain this ought be unabated throughout life. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. Love is a very personal decision.